Mm. We've received a special request. I was born in a snow-laden hamlet, peopled by Harvins, small folk more accustomed to the plow than the sword. We believe the sky's far too vast for us, and, as I was soon to learn, its dangers far too many. It happened when I was yet a green, callow youth. I strayed beyond our fences and into the claws of a monster. I cried for help. But all that met my voice were the howls of the wind. Abandoned even by hope, I could only give myself up to death. But before the darkness took hold, I saw brilliant figures skimming the sun-kissed snow. They were the Lumiel Order of Holy Knights, come to my rescue. Oh, that there were words bright enough to reflect their flashing swords as they did battle with the beast or sounds tender enough to echo the kindness with which they took my hand and led me home. What can I say, but that they were as mighty and generous as the sun? On that fateful day, they gave me life and guidance. I learned that by shutting your eyes to danger, you only leave it free to wander in the darkness. Thus, I resolved to turn toward the light and become defender to the skies. I would join Lumiel and, with my farmer's hands, bear aloft the banner of virtue. I threw all my being into training, begrudging no amount of sweat or tears. And, with the passing of days, that little girl lost in the snow grew to become the captain of the Lumiel Order of Holy Knights. As captain of an order of knights, I was faced with a colossal problem. And that was my small stature. No one had ever heard of a Harvin leading a charge, what with our stout legs and poor reach. Now that I lived among drafts and humans, I would have to develop a style of combat that would turn my size, if I may so phrase it, into a matter of little importance. Seeing that I worked twice as hard, despite being half as large, my compatriots grew to respect me. When I was appointed captain, their very heartstrings thrummed with joy. But even the brightest diamond has its flaws. Within Lumiel's proud walls, there were some that scoffed to behold a Harvin captain of their knights. For my part, I cared not what was said of me. However, I would not stand to have the good names of my comrades dragged through the mud. We are an august and redoubted order, and I'd rise up to that image, by any means necessary. Thus began my days of height exercises, stretching devices, and miraculous concoctions. Not all came from reputable sources, but I took a tactical approach. If it had a chance of working, I'd try it. Days grew into weeks, which grew into months, but I grew not one inch. Then, it happened. Right as I was on the verge of losing all hope, word reached me of a distant village that had devised a height tonic. Here was the answer to all my prayers! With expectation lending the spring to my step, I slipped from my quarters and set out on my quest. I had to take a mountain pass to the village, 
which was, in a word, perilous. Of course, I refer not to the countless monsters and bandits whom I took down with ease. It was the tall steps and great boulders, insurmountable obstacles for a harven. I was forced to return to the foothills where, through Lady Sierra Carte, I sent out a dispatch for help. That was how I met the captain and crew of the Grand Cipher. With their aid, I reached the village without further incident, only to have my dreams utterly crushed. It turned out that this magic tonic was merely your average growth stimulant, designed to help a budding youth blossom to a seemly height. It could do little for a woman like me, already in the prime of her life. Thus, all my best efforts were dashed to foam. For the first and only time in my life, I cursed fate for cutting me out of so short a cloth. However, it was within the depths of despair that I would find new hope. The crew of the Grand Cipher was bound for Estelusia, which is said to be an island of miracles. Could not some power there give me what I seek? With newfound resolve, I was determined to accompany the captain to the end of the skies. Needless to say, it pained me to take leave of the Lumiel Order. I still remember the look of surprise on former officer Bautorda's face when I told him of my resolution. But in the end, he expressed his admiration for me and my quest to become the very figure of virtue. Lady Bridget and Lady Cordelia also gave me their blessings. Oh, there are no words to express how grateful I am to my kind comrades. I dream of the day I can return to them with my head held high, and its crown measuring many feet taller, being, at long last, in both body and spirit, the captain they deserve. Such are my thoughts as I peer out over the railings of the Grand Cipher unto boundless, majestic skies. One day, when I was visiting Seed Hollow on business, I espied a young man crouched in a corner of the central plaza. There was no mistaking his must hair, a style rebellious youth called the Mohawk, and surly face. Here was Sir Soupstock, helmsman of the family Zafba. Is something the matter? The lad met my inquiry with a scowl. The hell are you looking at? Beat it, kid. Wait, hold on a sec. Are you a part of that crew? Assured of my goodwill, Sir Soupstock unfolded his troubles. Whilst making his usual rounds squaring away accounts, the lad had met with some resistance. One of their clients, a nobleman disdainful of Sir Soupstock's low birth and tender age, had refused to pay. I'm an officer too, you know. Got my own grunts working under me. Good people. But we're dealing with the real frilly pants, blue-blooded noble here. Any attempt to rough him up, and it's straight to the slammer. Twas a treacherous path, Sir Soupstock added. A single misstep, and it was his reputation in the mud. Hearing this, my heart went out to him. For I knew what it was like to feel green and small, with judging eyes upon me. I offered him my aid. I appreciate the thought, but no offense. Y you look like a kid. If I bring you on my rounds, they're gonna change my name from Soup Stock to Laughing Stock. At that moment, a servant arrived, bearing a message from the nobleman in question. It read, I've decided to pay. Meet me at the following location. This whole affair was starting to smell ranker than a goblin's breath. He could just as easily have sent money with the servant. Why go through the trouble of arranging yet another meeting? 
There was mischief afoot, and I resolved to accompany Sir Soupstock to stop it in its tracks. We arrived at the appointed location, a corner of Castle Seed Hollow, to find the nobleman gazing down at us from a parapet. Ah, just the face I've been waiting to see. My hair stood on end. A crooked smile on his face spoke louder than words. Though I knew his intentions to be wicked, still, I tried to help the man see reason. You gave your word to pay the family Zothba what they are due. Surely you would not break your troth and besmirch your honor. But the man only sneered. Leveling a finger at us, he cried, My brothers and sisters of the one true church, these are the enemies of Avia. In the blink of an eye, we were surrounded by Avia's soldiers. You did well to lead us here. So these were the remnants of Avia. Even the fall of the church had not been enough to shake their faith in Lilith. In their eyes, Sir Soupstock and I were interlopers. Blasphemers they must put to death. You've got another thing coming if you think you're gonna get away with this. Sir Soupstock glared up at the Cullion. I too felt a righteous rage boiling within me. Crooked vice must be beaten straight with the hammer of justice. You shall rue the day you brought the wrath of Charlotta Fenia upon your heads. If you will not listen to our demands, I shall be forced to compel you to. Hmm, does anyone else hear a buzzing little flea? Go forth, my Tayuatar, and decimate them. Do what we must, girls. They're kids. mine. Are we not the most formidable team? The Alpha, we're the best. Our no race is within me. Where is Kong? Understood. A fine showing. They shall quick before us. A coin was spared to ensure your defeat. If you've got that much dough, just pay us already. Hmm? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't speak commonly. You've got more fine than I thought. But no matter. I have soldiers enough to crush you. A thousand wicked soldiers is not worth one virtuous knife. How shall I ever repay you? Press forward! And impressed, I you. shall like the way. Understood. Do any of you claw up next to Johanna? 
Stay at the ready. War never sleeps. Great, but of course, you get right behind. Blazing broth. That crew of yours really is full of feasts. After making some courteous response to Sir Soupstock, I turned my attention to the nobleman. You must pay for what you bought. I thought even children knew that. And so, with many groans and grimaces, the varlet handed Sir Soupstock what he was owed. You sure got me out of a tight spot. Thanks. And... Sorry about all that crap I said about you looking like a kid. I assured him there were no hard feelings. Comforted, he continued. I shouldn't be saying this being in my line of business at all, but... Truth is, I'm not much of a fighter. Would have been dead meat if it weren't for you. He confided in me that, when the Tayuitar appeared, he felt the blood of courage draining from his body. I too am not immune to fear. But as a pure and righteous knight of Lumiel, I have duty, honor, and purpose as my guiding lights. Hearing that, Sir Soupstock graced me for the first time that day with a shy smile. Let's talk. What should I strengthen? Don't forget about upkeep. Wow! Oh no! Yeah. What can I do you for? One Skybearer's trash is another merchant's treasure. Skyfarers, want your weapons tempered? Always aim for the unlocked. I'll handle it. Your weapons won't betray you. We've received a special request. With the obvious soldiers defeated and the money safely in hand, I believed it to be clear skies. And yet, some cloud still darkens Sir Soupstock's brow. Man. I can't even do my job without somebody holding my hand. Maybe I just ain't cut out for this, yeah? Apparently, even his own officers afforded him little respect. However, I saw in his earnest eyes and noble bearing that he had the makings of a great leader. Alas, we cannot view ourselves but by outward reflection, which often dims our inner value. 
You were given high office, Sir Soupstock. Does that not mean someone sees in you true worthiness, though you yourself may be blind to it? You must polish yourself until the quality of your character shines forth for all the world to behold. If you remain forever pure and forever righteous, then surely those around you will be attracted by your light. The lad lent me an attentive ear. But my words were not enough to blow the clouds of doubt from his face. I mean, just take a look at how our city's split. You've got Golden Oaks, where the nobles and elite dwell, and the rest of us tucked away in Copper Square, which is, let's face it, a slum. He continued. Those wide-eyed beliefs of yours wouldn't last two seconds among the dirt and smoke of Copper Square. I wish I could be the person you say I am, but... Biting his lip, Sir Soupstock shook his head and fell silent. A few days later, Sir Soupstock asked me to meet with him again. In a cozy Seed Hollow Tavern, he told me he'd investigated our erstwhile friend, the nobleman. It seemed the scoundrel was now prancing about the city, spreading lies and slander about the family Zothba. Sir Soupstock hoped to make his own rounds and mend what damage he could, but, fearing yet another ambush from Avia, he hoped I would accompany him as his guard. His own staff, infuriated by the nobleman's dastardly doings, were foaming at the mouth and mad for a fight. However, the level-minded Sir Soupstock knew that stooping to bloody violence would only further stain their image. I've gone through his dirty linen, and believe me, there's a lot of filth. I'd leak it now, but with these rumors floating around, I don't know if anybody'd believe me. Never one to stand for such injustice, I began cudgeling my brain for a solution. We began to meet with people in the street, contradicting the libel and restoring faith in the family Zothba. I learned that a good informant is well-known and well-trusted, and, according to his own officers, no one in Seed Hollow was better liked than Sir Soupstock. Though his mannerisms savored, admittedly, of a brute, at his core he was as sweet and pure as any lily. It was little wonder the denizens of Seed Hollow were fond of him. As we exchanged more words and tidbits of information, a picture began to form of the nobleman's intentions. He was not acting, it seemed, solely from a place of vengeance. The Churl desired to build his own network of informants, using the remnants of the Church of Avia. Furthermore, in his lust for wealth, he was terrorizing the good people of Copper Square and compelling services from them. Thus, the family Zatba, who kept peace in the district, was to him a bother and a nuisance. It was likely he craved their banishment. Now, fully apprised of the situation, Sir Soupstock told me of his intention to once again meet face to face with the crafty villain. We called upon the nobleman, who, as before, had found himself a lofty place to stand, no doubt to compensate for his lowness of character. Sir Soupstock stepped bravely forth 
and spoke thus. Listen, punk. We know you've been kidnapping people and using them for forced labor, which is, FYI, illegal. I've also got proof that all the money from that phony charity of yours is being used to hire obvious soldiers. And? The nobleman showed no sign of discomposure. Not one hair on his well-groomed head stirred. And yet, Sir Soupstock, bless his valiant soul, refused to back down. Once this information gets out, you can kiss your fancy-ass titles goodbye. Oh, but it's not going to get out. You see, that's why I've threaded together my lovely little network. Those rumors I circulated? Merely the opening act. I've got the soldiers now, and come next week, it's curtains for the family Zaffa. The nobleman showed his teeth in a glacial grin. So you want all-out war? But why? Sir Soupstock stared back, fuming. Well, I suppose there's no harm in revealing my master plan here. Dead men tell no tales and all that. In the nobleman's eyes, coins from his charity were trickling toward a worthy cause. The subjugation of Copper Square. Putting the people there to work, he said, would do wonders for Seed Hollow's economy. Can't you see? I'm taking rubbish and forming it into something useful. You and all you Zothba toadies are standing in the way of progress! With that, the nobleman pointed an accusing finger at us. These interlopers mean to hinder the mission of the church. Destroy them. At the sound of his voice, Aviath soldiers sprung from the shadows and hemmed us in. Stand down, Sir Soupstock! I shall teach them a lesson they won't soon forget! Here was a knave that would exploit the weak for his own profit. If I failed to make him repent his crimes, it would be a stain on the name of the Lumiel Order! Fall, so that our church may rise again! I shall never fall to wickedness! Good? Evil? <laughs> it's all relative. Yes. It's the winners who write history after all. Then let us see who fights for the stronger cause. Tenacious little free, I'll give you that. But this time, I brought my most ruthless warriors. Violence and fear. Do you want this to be your legacy? At least I shall have a legacy. I shall be your son. Surrender! 
Oh, how were all those soldiers defeated by a single girl? Fortune favors the virtuous. A leader must earn the good graces of their followers through pure and righteous conduct. You cannot buy it with gold, nor command it with power or titles. But, instead of lending an ear to my advice, the nobleman began running his mouth, stabbing his own soldiers in the back with sharp words. I thought you Avia bunch were stronger. Pity. The whole damned lot of you aren't even worth a rupee. But don't think you've won, interlopers. I am still a member of the noblesse. Those copper square dogs would lick my shoes in return for a crumb of favor. You may celebrate your day, but the ultimate triumph shall be mine! You sure about that? Sir Soupstock pulled a transceiver from his pocket. Everything you've said to us, you've said to those copper square dogs. Face it, jackass. You're finished. Voices of censure and indignation began to spill from the transceiver. As Sir Soupstock turned a dial, they magnified, filling all the air with rage. It... it can't be... Here and there, amongst the heated words, were cries of exultation and praise for the family Zafba. Thus, overcome by a raging sea of noise, the nobleman bowed his proud head and fell to his knees. We've received a special request. Soupstock and his staff expressed great admiration for my swordplay. It's just mind-boggling, you know? You've probably trained harder than most of the best mercenaries out there. His words raised the gate on a flood of memories, washing me back to a time when I was desperate to prove myself. Yes, it took hard training and much toil to come this far, but I would have collapsed by the wayside long ago if there hadn't been people who supported me on my path. I am where I am because of them. Now, I try to pay their goodwill forward by helping others as they helped me. So you never stopped trying to be the best version of yourself. Sir Soupstock turned his eyes toward the heavens. I wish I could be strong like you. I wish I had the guts to just go busting in through the front door, sword blazing and ready to dispense justice. Hearing this, all of his officers raised their voices in protest. But you are strong! You got it all, man! The brains, the chill, the network, and the integrity. You could search the whole sky and never find a better informant. We're proud to work for you. Couldn't have said it better myself. Sir Zafba, who'd been watching from afar, made his way forward and clapped a hand on Sir Soupstock's shoulder. It did good, Soupstock. Just like I knew you would. Boss, it's... it's an honor. <laughs> and that was the first time I ever saw Sir Soupstock give free rein to his emotions. When I visited Seed Hollow some time later, I heard at the Knick-Knack Shack a certain rumor. Apparently, one of the officers of the family Zotva had taken up Forever Pure, Forever Righteous as his creed. Even his staff could be heard reciting the words. The Justice Soup Gang, led by Mr. Moha, has been getting a lot of missions lately, and the family Zotva stocks are on the rise. Their soup stock, that is. 
<laughs> I glanced about me and saw only faces as bright as the sun. And I knew in my heart that the warmth of those smiles did not derive from Lady Sierra Carte's rather pitiable jest. We've received a special request. I trusted only my fists. If you wish to reach transcendence, you must beat out the path with your own knuckles. Which is why, when my fists began to tremble in anticipation, I listened. It was as if they whispered, A terrible future awaits these skies. Fail to act. An unprecedented calamity will befall you. How could they know? In truth, they knew more than most scholars, having experienced the rigors of fundamental aesthetic practice. I tempered them relentlessly till they could foretell which timeline would lead them to the most strength. But you may ask, how far can one go with omnipotent fists? A foolish question. Only cowards measure progress in distance, in achievement. Blood boils through these fingers. That is all I need to know. Ah. I feel the fire raging inside. The storm has arrived. And I shall catch it with my bare hands. Divinity above, I wish you no ill will, but your defeat shall be evidence of my life's work. Foul recited, I ended the evening's meditation. Decades of such ascetic training had finally borne fruit. I had honed the eternal raid style to a godlike edge. But the long years had also revealed to me an enemy I could never defeat. Time itself. My inevitable demise meant there would be no more eternal raid style. I would need a disciple. Someone worthy of inheriting my technique. Of course, coal is not transformed into diamond so easily. It would be a fool's errand to find a successor who could survive the necessary time and rigor. Thus, when I finally met the captain, I was happy to be that fool. Now I could pass on my legacy. But the captain had another goal in mind, to reach Estalusia and reunite with dear old Papa. 
filial piety was a respectable tenant, but it was no God-shattering fist. Despite my pleas, I failed to convince the captain to become my pupil. However, something must have resonated with the young master, because I received an invitation to join the Grand Cipher's crew. If I could not produce a scion of eternal rage, at least I would gain new allies. Walking aboard the airship, my fists buzzed. Ah, so there would be something more to this meeting after all. Worthy Captain, I choose to fight by your side for the glory of the crew, for the glory of reaching Estelusia. And after we return, we shall discuss your future with the Eternal Rage style in earnest. You heard all the stories about the old man, right? I could hardly believe my ears. Ripping the grim face in apart with a single punch? Joining a war just so he could spar and defeating both sides? Knocking over a whole mountain just from turning in his sleep? I call BS. And just like crap, there was probably a kernel of truth in there somewhere, but come on, who believes this stuff? <laughs> Turns out, idiots like me. See, I've actually witnessed Gondagoza smash a meteor into space dust. You think people will catch on to that story, too? Of course they will. Why else do people go to the pub? Man's favorite pastime is recounting tales of people braver than themselves. But it's so hard to believe, and I saw him do the damn thing. So, yep, though the old master's legends were numerous, and honestly downright ridiculous, they were also the truth. What's crazier, Ganda would never toot his own horn. After crushing a dragon with a sneeze or what have you, he'd just say... Ugh. Yep, actions speak louder than words. That's a real man's man for you. You gotta admire that. What I would give for his rippling biceps, though. Looking back now, none of us could have known. There, in the Zeca Grande Skydom, Gondagoza was about to use those rippling biceps to start a whole brand new mythos. Sierra gave us the news. A lone brawler managed to stop a force of hundreds atop Mount Nagelith, all while quelling a raging blizzard with his bare hands? I'm not a betting man. Well, I'm not a drinking man. But, well, I'm not a man who bets when he drinks. But I put good money on our brawler being Gondagoza. It hadn't been that long since we sailed the Zega Grande. So the old badger must have been working overtime for word to spread so quick. I asked Sierra to spill the details. The force he scattered was a group of soldiers, remnants of the Church of Avia, and word was they were specialists in guerrilla warfare. Sure as hell they were a fierce troop. How does an unarmed martial artist take them all out? Not that I could ask the master, because you know what he'd say. <laughs> But hey, who needs words when you got those defined shoulder blades doing the talking? Guess it was just one more legend for the books.
Call for reinforcements! We need all the support we can get! Why is everyone from that crew a beast? What are they feeding them on that ship? It was a nightmare. Actually, worse. You could wake up from a nightmare. This was our reality. We were being driven into the heart of Mount Najaleth by a single Skyfarer. Even though he was alone, he was with the crew who defeated General Galanza. Our only chance was to put aside our pride and work together to take him down. Our platoon was experienced, and we could launch the prototype Tayuatar if things started looking rough. We had numbers and strategy on our side. With all of our preparations, victory should have been assured. But he took one look at our perfect formations and laughed. Ha 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 ha! You honor me with this extra treat! Ah, Gandagosa shall now return the favor with eternal rage! You what? This guy was nuts. All of these soldiers, and this was just a field exercise to him? Get your asses in gear! Do not break ranks! The command snapped my mind back into focus. I drew my sword, but as I clutched its hilt, I had never been more sure it was just a hunk of scrap metal. He walked the path of eternal rage. Keep your distance, or you won't make it out of here alive. Watch it! How will you train from so far away? The wind rises! This guy have a weapon. Is this a joke to him? Who is this guy? Could be the devil himself for all I care. So back up. We can't take him on our own. Step forward. I still need to finish my warm up. From the clouds, breaks the storm! My fish grow restless! Curse on luck! He's leaving me with no option! Switch to plan C. Plan C? But sir, he doesn't even have armor on. Just do it. Either we deploy our secret weapon, or he'll wipe us out. Who go, Tyuatar? Deliver us from this accursed giant. Hmm. I applaud your desire to continue fighting, but you insult me with these useless toys. The Toker. He took out the Tyuatar. Of course he did. I want all units deployed. Courage, troops! No one lives forever! With these fists, nothing is impossible! I like you! Our hawk! Skybreaker! Hands up! Monster! Commander, your orders! Commander? Reject impossibility! It was a nightmare. Actually worse. You could wake up from a nightmare. This was our reality.
Where are they? Bring me your champions! We were an entire platoon of pilgrims. We even deployed the Taiyuitar. He wasn't even inconvenienced. Retreat! Retreat! My mind was cloudy. I barely heard the commander's order. How could I think? I saw it. I saw the force of his punches redirect the blizzard. He had to be a demon. No mortal could beat the damn weather into submission. Not to mention the lack of corpses. This battle had been brutal, but so far no one has sustained critical injuries. Which means he had been holding back. A man like this, he was as strong as General Galanza. No, stronger maybe. Finally, I gathered enough sense to unfreeze my feet and turn tail. As I ran away, I got the sense I had just witnessed history in the making. We've received a special request. I will finally remember my splendid time atop Mount Natalith. Deadly blizzard pummeling my flesh, freezing cold stabbing my lungs, and swarms of monsters looking to turn me into a long overdue meal. These were already the perfect conditions for training, but sweet, generous fortune had even more in store. I crested a snowy gnome, and what should I see but the obvious crusaders setting up camp for their own war games. Follow the fist, or it shall lead to serendipity. Unfortunately, however, it seemed my newfound sparring partners were on a stricter schedule than I, as they took their leave before I could properly thank them. Bandagoza, a letter came for you. Hmm. Now this was a rare occurrence. It looks like it's from... Whoa, no way! Her mouth was agape. I peered down to read why. From Kalanza. The Silver Wolf Corps General. This would be intriguing. To Master Gondagosa. Distinguished Practitioner of the Eternal Rage Style. Thank you for meeting my strongest force on the field of battle. They spoke highly of your ferocity. In fact, some suggest you may be stronger than me. Which is why I demand a duel. If you are not a coward, meet me in front of Tradam's Sanctuary. Atop Mount Natalin. ASAP! I expect a death match as the skies have never seen before! Find the invincible and unparalleled general of the Silver Wolf Corps, Galanza! could happen during a fight with that man. What loving kids to spare their thoughts for me. But Galanza was a man of unparalleled battle acumen. I could not pass on such an opportunity. To call myself the greatest fighter in all the skies, I must best the greatest fighters in all the skies. The captain looked at me with trusting eyes, as if to say, go, noble warrior. This crew believes in the might of your god-shattering fists. Seeing the tacit acceptance of their commanding officer, Lyria and Vern finally relented. But 
They insisted on joining, in case the worst befell me. Their support was my tailwind. We left for the battlefield. Witness me, children. I shall fight the fight of rain! Good. You're right on time! Dantagosa and Galanza stood opposite one another. The air was tense, one spark from exploding. Dantagosa, of the Eternal Rage style, at your service. Dantagosa spread his legs shoulder width apart and raised his fist. He was ready for... In his corner, the Silver Wolf himself! Galanza! And in this corner, a man whose sheer rage is matched only by his weird beard, Gandagoza! Ah, you nearly gave me a heart attack! Where did you come from? Yeah, ref. What are you doing here? You could get hurt. I've been following the legend of a master martial artist for years, and today, all of us will finally see his fist reach for the title of Strongest! Don't blink or you'll miss it! A new legend is about to be born! Sounds like somebody could use a reality check. Suddenly, things had gone from tense to... weird and tense. Now, once again, Sky Folk of all ages! Prepare yourselves for... Don't step on our gig. There's already too many characters in this scene. We'll do the commentating around here. Burn, no! We're not licensed to broadcast. But never mind about our qualifications. Something more important was on the line. I want a clean fight. Now, believe in victory! Engage! We walk the path. Of eternal rage. Ooh. Well, the match of the century has just begun. Who do you think has the upper hand here, Lyria? Yeah, yeah. I'm so expert, but I was going to go the time. There you have it. Our sky-faring heroine has spoken. Her words are sure to bring hot strength to her crewmate. Is that bias on the mic? You know better than that, Raph. Bring it. <laughs> So, shoulder. I felt that one in my back. Victory! I shall join. Columns has drawn his spear. He'll be able to cover us ton of turf with that sucker. Huh. It takes strength to wield a weapon like that. I welcome this type of pressure. Yeah, I like it. Ah. Yeah! 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 Yeah!
Gosa and Galanza were going all out. They were like warring primals, blasting each other with crazy techniques. Finally, when the dust had settled... The last man standing is Gonda Goza! Let's hear it for those furious fists of legend, ladies and gents! Megapops pulled off the victory, though Galanza was no slouch either. Simply put, the stronger man took the match. Boy, I wish I were ripped like Gonda. If I had his muscles, I bet I could have stopped that whole Avia mess in two seconds flat. Oops, where was I? Right, Megapops had done it again. He'd proven himself in the ring and taken out one of the Skydom's best fighters. Score one more for the Eternal Rage Legacy. I couldn't wait to get back and tell Rackham and Oigen the good news. They were basically gone to Storians by now, and this would be one more legend for their repertoire. All right. Mm. If you're stomach growling, give it what you want. All right. 
We've received a special request. Did Vern tell you what Oganda's been up to lately? Fighting off a hundred soldiers? Okay, sure. He's got chops. Pushing back a blizzard? Uh, I'll buy it. He's got elemental attunement out the wazoo, but taking out Galanza in a death match? <laughs> Sounds like we're all losing our marbles now. And what's this about their fight being so ferocious that carved out a new valley through Mount Nazalith? Has anyone verified that? And turning the island upside down? Come on, people. Ganda, folks are starting to take your stories a little too far. That or you're doing way too much, and I really hope it's the former. Ah, what am I saying? If you ever stop your crazy exploits, I'll eat my helmsman's license. Hmm. <laughs> yep, that stoic silence explained it all. For some, an unbelievable legacy might be too heavy to bear, but I doubt there's anything those broad shoulders couldn't lift. All of his stories have proven true so far. Maybe, just maybe, he really would sock it to a god one day. I get to read it first, Eugen. I bought the damn thing. Over my dead body. I was just getting to the good part. Yeah! Take that. Fist of the Red Lotus. My fellow crewmates stood around a wall scroll. Fascinating. Rackham procured it from Seed Hollow, I gathered. But wait. Had Eugen not just vocalized and then improperly executed one of my techniques? Bizarre! While Eugen and Rackham were distracted by their noble bickering, Lyria brought the scroll over. When she flicked it open, my breath caught. Is that me? Is that supposed to be me? My likeness, stylized and somehow prettier, was punching back a blizzard in an illogical way. Don't these petty painters know that one must channel the ferocity of the storm? To beat the storm? Someone asked an artist to paint your story. Look how great it turned out. I had to admit, they did a decent job of capturing the majesty of my maid. Even if it were a bit too bushy. <laughs> I could not help but laugh. Of all the places my fists had taken me, this was the first where I had encountered my own facsimile. Though I hadn't bothered to tell anyone of my training on Mount Natalith, perhaps I should be more vocal in the future. If not only to add more fan art to my widening legends, what joy that would spread! Ha 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 ha! We've received a special request. I'm from Tremont Island, a quiet little place where I lived with my parents and sister. Things were good, except my sister was suffering from a terrible condition. We couldn't treat her on Tremont, so she was forced to travel to another island, all on her own. 
Back then, Skyfaring wasn't nearly the safe bet that it is today, so I wasn't sure if she'd even make it there, let alone receive treatment. I loved my sister more than anything, so waving bye to her as she took off toward an unknown future was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I hoped beyond all hope. I hoped till it hurt that her cure would be swift and she'd sail back to me with each setting sun. But the days, they grew into months. Some time after she left, a brutal pandemic spread across Tremont, crippling our population in a matter of days. I was shocked, watching the good people I'd known all my life pass away. But I was horrified when it claimed my parents. And when it came for me, I knew death was waiting at the front door. What can I do? I thought, lungs heavy and weighing me to my bed. What could I do but turn to the skies and pray? Please, if you're listening, I want to hear my family. I want to hear their voices again. My pleas were answered, but not by salvation. No, it was Celeste the primal beast of death who descended from the heavens. She stole death from the suffering islanders, preventing them from slipping into the afterlife. They became zombies, sentient and rotting. Unlike the others, my corporeal form faded away, leaving my spirit to haunt the land. This, at least, gave me a faint hope. If I was given an unlife, then perhaps my mother and father would be given the same gift. But the months, they grew into years. And it became clear that though Celeste held dominion over death, life was a more complicated matter. It was my wish that had brought unlife to Tremont. I was to blame for turning my hometown into a living cemetery. If the villagers knew what I had done, well... That's why I chose to haunt the manor on the outskirts of town. Alone in those halls, with no one to talk to, I counted the days until I lost track of time. Solitude was better than guilt. Isolation was better than hearing my name used as a curse. But with time, the silence ate away at my name, until even I forgot who I was. It's true that there weren't people around the manor, but I did discover a few ghost animals floating about. They took a liking to me, probably because of our shared ghosthood, and I gave them cute names to show my affection. Beppo, Gigi, Fuji, and Nicola. Before I knew it, my lonesome days became a little less gray, if not less repetitive. I watched so many tomorrows and yesterdays pass me by. I felt as stale and constant as the mists that covered the island. That all changed when the crew came to my manor. They were a cheerful, lively group. But also straightforward and intimidating. It had been so long since I needed to interact with other people. I knew that if I made contact, I would have to acknowledge the real depth of my loneliness. So I ran. And they gave chase. So I ran again. And they followed once more. No matter where I fled, they found me. Undeterred by my spectral form or my ghostly pets. Finally, I decided to ask them about their situation. Thanks to the mists, they explained, their airship was grounded on Tremont. Like me, like the other islanders. We were all prisoners of Celeste. So long as she still had a pact with the island, there would be no refuge from her fog. But, by the same token, her powers preserved the unlives of Tremont's people, myself included. If Celeste was brought down, we would fade with her. 
It troubled me, but I knew it was a necessary course of action. I had only one thing to accomplish before confronting the primal beast of death. I needed to come clean to the islanders. It was time to make amends. Had it not been for the arrival of the captain and the crew, I would never have found the strength to make that decision. I marched straight to the village, took a deep breath, and explained to the people how I doomed everyone. But to my surprise, they looked upon me with sympathy and warmth. With the understanding and support of the Islanders, I called Celeste once again. But she didn't appear, and the mist still covered the island. That's how I learned the truth. It wasn't only me who had crossed Celeste's fate with our own. The other culprit was the doctor who was traveling through our village, back when the pandemic first appeared. He was secretly conducting research to summon Celeste, we hurried to the place where he resided, but... When we arrived, we found that his consciousness had already been swallowed by the primal beast of death, and he couldn't cough up any helpful information. Despite the setback, I joined with the crew and the islanders to find and defeat Celeste. The mists parted, and the island returned to its former state. Its residents began to pass into the great beyond, disappearing into light. Before long, everyone I'd known had been lifted into the bright sky, leaving behind only their memories. I closed my eyes and waited for my final moments. But no matter how long I waited, I never began to fade. Left behind, yet again. I stared out at the village, devoid of residents. I was alone, but I could accept that. At any rate, the nameless ghost was no more, because a strange man gave me an oddly familiar name. So long as I had that name, and my memories with the crew, I could wait decades, maybe even centuries, for my sister to return. I think the captain, however, couldn't bear leaving me to such a hollow fate, and invited me to the crew. But how could I leave the island? I knew that my little sister would come back to me. Even though we were no more than graves and warm thoughts, this is where her family was laid to rest. If she came back and no one was waiting, wouldn't she be sad? That's why I knew I had to stay. But the captain wouldn't hear of it. If I was worried about my sister, I should go look for her. It was a new chance. I had never been off my island. I had never even considered the option. But I knew I could. I just needed to find the courage. And that's how I set out on a journey with the crew. Somewhere, out there in that big blue sky, my sister is waiting for me. One day, I was out shopping in Seed Hollow Central Plaza when I saw a woman with kind eyes sitting on a bench. She was absorbed in her needlepoint. Your embroidery is beautiful. Oh, aren't you a dear? Thank you. Her smile was genuine and cozy, just like the blanket she was working on. She told me it was a present for her beloved. I've never seen anyone so outside before. She giggled. Really? I'm hoping some of this cheerful sunlight works its way into the fiber. Her name was Melfira, and she invited me to have a seat beside her. Admittedly, the weather was beautiful, the kind that made you appreciate being alive. Or, well, unalive. 
There was a long, thin trail of white dividing the sky. The aftermath of an unfortunate cloud that had been pierced by a wayfaring airship. How fragile those clouds. How fragile our journeys. I glanced back at Malfira, who looked to be making diligent progress. A familiar memory crept to mind. Of a time when I begged my mother to sew new stuffed animals for me and my sister. The nostalgia was comfortable. Welcomed, even. But I was brought back to the present when I heard a troubled sigh from beside me. Following you. Is something wrong? Such a forlorn expression didn't match Malfira's cheerful disposition. Oh, sorry to worry you. It's nothing I would bother a stranger over. Malfira forced a grin and stretched the throw across her lap. It's just, I had hoped to use warming thread on this little project. What kind of thread? I didn't even know there were different types of thread. But according to Malfira, there was a type of insect, native to Fondam, whose silk was imbued with magic. Items made from this silk were said to retain a comfortable warmth all year round. If only I could get to Fondam on my own. And then there's the matter of tracking the insect. Her smile never quavered, but the way her eyebrows stitched together, ever so slightly, overtly signaled her true disappointment. I could do it for you! I know I look young, but I'm a veteran Skyfarer! I put my hands on my hips and puffed out my chest, a posture I hoped would inspire confidence. Oh, that's sweet. But it was just a silly thought. My fault for having unrealistic expectations, really. From her tone alone, I could tell the pose did not, in fact, inspire confidence. Later, after a quick discussion with the captain, we decided to head to Fondam anyway. I needed Melfira to finish her blanket. I just didn't understand why yet. Everyone, to the fight! According to Sierra, the insect in question nests atop the local wildlife, but there's a room where the vicious monster also makes its home here. Stay on your toes. Looks look like fire spirits. We better get them before they get us again. You know! Don't get you! wanted to put a smile on Melfira's face. She looked so... I don't know... forlorn? But it was your first time meeting her, wasn't it? Who's she to you? Hmm... 
I know it's a weird connection, but her name, it sounded like my sister's. to fight. Let's teach him not to butt in. I see through you. It blow up. I'm not getting A smashing success. That pack of yours deserves the highest honor. Attack! Lightning! Uh, nothing of consequence, I guess. Bad yourself. It's all right, Nicola. I'll protect you from the mean monsters. Let's go in. Do it again. That's the advantage. Oh, Gigi. Beppo. Down, boys. You can't play so close to the magma. What if you fall in? vicious monster we heard about. If you thought you could get a leg up on us, you have another thing coming. Now, get ready! We'll handle them. Let's move up. Okay, got it. Just move things carefully. Out of practice. How fast! in peace. Is this what you were looking for? I proudly displayed the hard-won thread to a surprised and overjoyed Malfira. My word, you really are a Skyfarer, aren't you? She took the spool for a closer look. Yes, this is the genuine article. I can't accept this for free. Let me see what money I have on me. From her purse, she pulled a single, unfamiliar coin. I knew from its extravagant design that it wasn't in circulation anywhere near Seed Hollow, but it looked valuable all the same. I refused the gesture. Retrieving the thread was my decision, 
I wanted to see that blanket finished. A reward was never part of the equation. Melfira's grin bloomed into a full belly laugh. She told me I was a strange girl. Laughing with her, I replied that I had been a stranger. We've received a special request. We made another pit stop in Seed Hollow, which gave me the chance to check up on Malfira and her progress with the blanket. Lyria and Vern came with me. And their eyes lit up when they saw her intricate embroidery, just like mine did that first sunny day. Though I hadn't known Melfira for very long, I felt a kinship with her, and I liked to watch her determination evolve with each new stitch. But most of all, I liked that her kind smile, maternal and comforting, was always able to put me at ease. I'd never met anyone so genuine. In fact, nor had my pets. You're a spooky boy. Yes, you are. Malfira playfully scratched behind Beppo's ears. The mood was light, so I decided to learn a little more about my friend. I noticed you're in the central plaza quite often. <laughs> more or less. I don't have much else to occupy my time. Not with that silly boy still playing in the sand. Melfira's partner was a geologist on dispatch in Dolly, an extended dispatch, it seemed. Dolly was an island of deserts, with bitterly cold nights. To Malfira, a cozy blanket seemed the perfect way to combat the harsh environment. Maybe it won't be necessary. He's coming back for a visit on the Airbus next month, and I'm about to burst with excitement! Her joy should have been infectious. Try as I might to put on a brave face, my heart sank at her words. The Airbus from Dolly? Of course. During the next month's visit, Melfira looked more downtrodden than I had ever seen. Vern expressed his distress before I could vocalize my own. Holy spools, lady! You look like you've been up all night! You feeling okay? Melfira meekly raised her head, barely affording him a grin. 
my love. He didn't come back to me. It took me a moment to find a response. I'm sure... I bet he'll find a way to return next month. She had already been waiting an eternity for him. What comfort were my words? And yet, she still found the strength to smile. I hope so. I'm so tired of moping around like this. It's getting harder to stay positive, but I'll find a way for his sake. <laughs> that man, you know, he's so absent-minded, he probably mixed up the date on his ticket. <laughs> Malfira unrolled the blanket across her lap, checking the backing of her stitching. Hmm. I've poured a lot of love into this design. I hope he likes it. As she vacillated from melancholy to forced cheer and back again, I had to bite my lip for fear my thoughts would spill out. One month passed, and still no word from Elfira's beloved. I'm sure he has his reasons. Lyria tried to comfort the young seamstress, but Malfira's smile was noticeably dimmer than before. Yes, you're right. He's not one to take risks or push himself too far. There's nothing to worry about, I'm sure. Her words sounded strained like she was trying to convince herself. I thought I knew what was happening, but I couldn't bring myself to acknowledge it. Not yet. We were all stuck in awkward silence, so I changed the subject. How did you two meet? It was in this very plaza. He was a bookworm, so he came here to do his reading. I was out catching some sun myself, when he found the courage to sit next to me, I turned to greet him and he shoved a book on embroidery in my face. <laughs> Not the greatest first impression, huh? Energy returned to her movements. Color returned to her smile. So what did you do? <laughs> You're going to laugh. I told him I already owned the book. His face turned pale as a ghost. But it was cute, seeing him all vulnerable, so I asked his name, and the rest is history. She shut her eyes, savoring the nostalgia, then she sighed. <laughs> Guess I'll have to go to Dolly and drag him home myself, won't I? No, not that. I couldn't let her go to Dolly alone. After witnessing her optimism return, I couldn't let her learn the truth. Let's do this. I see you have need for a great warrior. No, you should stay here. We'll go for you. Dolly can be a dangerous place, and I'm sure your partner wouldn't want anything to happen to you. I hoped that logic would be enough. Dolly? Dangerous? But so many people live there. Hmm. But if a sky-faring crew is offering their services, who am I to deny professionals? Vern scrunched his face in confusion. Lots of people? 
What are you talking about? Dolly's basically a giant sand... A quick nudge was enough to interrupt Vern. I hoped Malfira had missed the majority of his comment. You can trust us. We handle this kind of assignment all the time. We'll be back before you know it. Okay, let's do it. My air of confidence, false though it was, seemed to bring her welcome relief. Could you take the blanket with you? I wanted to give it to him myself, but I know he's probably already spent weeks freezing at night, and it won't do me any good here. She pushed a soft bundle into my hands. It was warm to the touch, thanks to the silk from Fondom, but it was also warm to the soul, thanks to the love and care that Malfira put into every stitch. Of course, it would be my pleasure. Everyone, to the fight! According to Malfira's map, the excavation was near the central ruins. Are you sure you want to trust that dusty old thing? Point taken. But we can at least get a sense for the lay of the land. Now let's go. This place is crawling with monsters. Stay on your toes, everyone. Right there. You know what to do. I'm on it. I'll do it. Oh, oh my stalwart oh, ally. You are amazing. I could keep this Stay up focused. all day. Sure thing. One more. <laughs> Clean this place up so we can start our search. This feels right somehow. Afraid so. He's no longer with us, but we've at least found his resting place. That's some comfort. What? No! 
That's impossible. We all stood before a grave, created 15 years ago in the wake of a terrible calamity. Carved on the back were the names of the deceased. And there, in the middle of them all, was the name of Malfira's beloved. I wrapped the blanket around the stone, tying it securely so the harsh desert environs wouldn't steal it, like it stole the lives of these scholars. Maybe it would at least keep their memory warm. Malfira put her heart and soul into this blanket. Take care of it, okay? We've received a special request. When I returned to Seed Hollow, Malfira's voice was shaky. Is he... okay? I couldn't face her as I struggled out a response. He's... fine. He said the survey was taking longer than expected. That it's going to be a while before he can join you. Oh, thank goodness. I was starting to fear the worst. She was relieved. I was crushed. But how could I bring myself to tell her the truth? He said thanks for the blanket. That he'll never feel cold again. Of course he won't. We made sure of that by retrieving the silk from Fondum. Malfira's joy was contagious, but I still had to force myself to smile. I'm not sure if my act was convincing, but I knew, more than anything, that I didn't want to show her how sad I truly was. When her own grin softened, I knew my ruse had failed. If anything, my glaring lies had only cast a light on the truth she'd buried deep in her mind. Oh, I can't thank you enough for delivering the blanket. I knew I couldn't rest until it was safely in his arms. It clicked. Malfira knew what she was. She knew what I was. Hearing the sorrow evaporate entirely from her voice confirmed it. But now nothing bound her to the world. And she began to fade, like mist in the morning light. I watched, tears in my eyes, as the contours of her form blurred into abstraction. Somewhere deep down, I knew I had died. It was the day he left for Dolly. I'm not sure what happened, but I just had to wait for him, hoping he would come sit next to me one more time. I've held on to that hope for what seems like an eternity. Malfira, I'm sorry. I feel like I lied to you. Oh, hush now. I bent the truth too, didn't I? I was glad for your company. Happy to have someone to chat with. Malfira brought her hands to her chest and looked up to the infinite blue stretching above us. Do you think he liked the blanket? Do you think he's warm now? He was overjoyed. You found the best thread, stitched away in the sun, and poured your love into it. How could he not be? She smiled her last to me, more genuine and placid than ever before. Before we went to Dali, I wanted to confirm my suspicions about Malfura. I checked with an airship engineer about airbuses to the desert. Dolly? No liner's been out that way for about 15 years now, on account of what happened and all. He explained that the last ship to Dolly was filled with scholars and their families, leaving on a journey from which they'd never return. But 15 years. She'd been waiting 15 years to deliver her gift. I knew her isolation. I wouldn't let her wait any longer.
Before I was ready to part ways with Malfira for good, I decided I needed to build a new grave for her and her beloved in Dolly. I realized that she had been right. With both sand and chill nipping at your skin, the desert nights really were cold and unfriendly. Wrapping the blanket around the new gravestone, I looked up at the full moon and saw two shooting stars falling through the night sky like tears down a cheek. And I knew, despite the chill, this was the perfect resting place. I turned to my pets. It's okay now. They'll never be apart again. Come again! You have my aid. I'm ready to fight. Where are we going? We've received a special request. I come from a long lineage of proud warriors. We had a great number of visitors at our dojo, many of them masters of their respective disciplines. At some point, I picked up a blade of my own and began to mimic their movements. Back then, I enjoyed the training for what it was, valuing the journey over the destination. That is, until I met him, the Supreme Swords Master of the Eternals, Aata, once known as the demon Zamba. With a single glance, he identified all of my weaknesses. Then, with a few words, he taught me to overcome them. His strength was beyond captivating. I even eavesdropped on a conversation between him and my father, and discovered we were distant relatives. I was elated. For some time, he continued to train at our family dojo. I took every opportunity I could to learn from him, following him wherever he went. I ate whenever he ate. I committed all his mannerisms to memory. However, with the exception of our first encounter, he never acknowledged me. After all, he yearned for nothing more than strength. Why pay heed to a weakling such as myself? So I vowed to become stronger. I would soar so high, he'd have to see me. I dedicated myself to training begrudging even a single moment of respite. The blade was everything to me. And eventually, there was no disciple at the dojo who could come close to rivaling my skill. That was around when he vanished. In the blink of an eye, he was out of my life. He spoke not another word to me, nor called me by name. I was meditating in the forest one day, when a group of travelers approached me. I didn't know them, but they were the captain and the crew of the Grand Cipher, and my future. Initially, I thought they were lost and had come to ask for directions. I was only half-cracked. They were seeking guidance, but 
not out of the woods. They wanted to learn martial arts from me. I shook my head. I was no master, only a chrysalis struggling to break free of my own shell. I believed the captain was mocking me, but that wasn't the case. I looked into the captain's eyes and found truth, alongside a burning desire for strength. It felt as if I was in his presence again. I found myself drawn to the captain. That's why I decided to join the crew of the Grand Cipher on their journey across the skies. I was convinced that this was the only path that could reunite me with Zomba. One day, I encountered an adorable Harvin girl at a local market. I'd already finished my shopping, so I decided to accompany her to a nearby cafe for tea and conversation. Upon parting, I asked for her name. She proudly introduced herself as Thief, one of the Ten Eternals. I had heard that Zomba once cared for a child of the same name. A jealousy brewed within me. That I hadn't felt before. Zanba had taken notice of her, yet he never once acknowledged me during our time together. My inner peace had been shattered. I retreated to the mountains and started my training anew. But the more I tried to find direction, the more I realized how lost I truly was. It was Lyria and the captain who brought me back. They appreciated me for who I was. Nothing more, nothing less. Perhaps I too could learn to love the living, breathing me, and not a ghost of the future. That thought filled me with so much contentment. I was ready to give up on chasing Zomba. But the universe works in strange ways. As soon as I was about to let go, Thief helped bring me and Zomba together again. It was then I finally put into words how I felt. I spoke about how I wanted him to acknowledge me, to call my name. He listened quietly, and for what I felt was the first time, truly saw me. But I had yet to see in love myself. As part of my quest for self-discovery, I crossed blades with Zomba. No, Aata. We fought for days. He no longer believed I was a weakling. After our battle, we visited the tea shop, and it was there that he first addressed me by name. Never had tea and cake tasted so sweet to me. Now, with nothing holding me back, I am free to soar toward ever greater heights with my beloved companions on the Grand Cipher. We know I had failed that day at the Hale Wind Altar. I had spent years training and sharpening my skills, devoted my entire life to the pursuit of strength. But in that moment, it all amounted to nothing. Our experiences in Zego Grande had planted a seed of doubt in my mind. Over time, it grew, dense and wild as a jungle choking me with a sense of helplessness like I'd never felt before. I wasn't able to protect Lyria or the captain. I had found my identity as a big sister, as a guardian, but now that I'd failed, who was I? I thought about resuming my training, but I couldn't afford to isolate myself like that. What if something were to happen while I was away? Then... The solution came to me. Whenever the captain was about to take on a dangerous mission, I would complete it first. That way, I could train myself and protect the crew in one fell swoop. 
I was too blind to see. The despair had clipped my wings and chained me once again to the past. Are there any particularly dangerous missions available? Sierra Carte, with her usual cheery disposition, set a list of options before me. Sure are! We've got a few jobs here that only a crew of your caliber could handle. In fact... She paused and looked at me with a quizzical expression. You know, I can't even remember the last time I saw you here by your lonesome. Don't you usually do things as a crew? I told her I intended to undertake these missions alone, as part of my training. I gotcha. The grind never ends for you, huh? Just don't push yourself too hard, you hear? I nodded, only half acknowledging Ciro's words. After deciding upon a venture, I chartered a small carrier vessel which would take me to a nearby island. As the ship was tossed about the turbulent winds, I closed my eyes and looked for peace within. This is for their sake, as well as mine. According to Ciro, the threat should be somewhere around here. Settles. I sense great evil. Just a little farther. Your shield, or my blade. Uh, Not yet. Rain, I can see how this battle will end. It ends with your death! Nice fall. The final song. <laughs> Such malice. You cannot be allowed to live. Huh? The butterfly in Whoa. Wind in the fields. You bring nothing to the skies but suffering. Paris! Worthless. But it's not over yet. I will not rest while evil runs free. Do you not have anything... more... dangerous? I made quick work of the mission, and returned at once to Sierra. She seemed taken aback when I demanded more work, but I was determined. If someone had to risk their life, better me than the captain. The crew didn't have to know. They would be kept free from worry and danger, while I grew stronger. Hmm... I was so absorbed in my thoughts, I'd failed to notice how Sierra's eyes grew ever more clouded with worry.
We've received a special request. I continued to take one treacherous job after another. If you want someone safe, then keep them from entering the tiger's den. It's as simple as that. Are you really sure you're up for another one, Nermaya? Sierra worried for me, but there was no turning back now. My labor had bore fruit. The rest of the crew was beginning to look healthier, better rested. They returned earlier from missions, bearing fewer injuries. I appreciate the concern, Sierra, but the path to strength is long and narrow. And I must continue down this path, for all of their sakes. I was fixated on protecting my loved ones. They were all I could see. If they were safe, then nothing else mattered. That thought alone was enough to steal my resolution. On days without work, I would meditate on the deck of the Grand Cipher. One day, the voice of Vern broke through my meditations. I don't know. She looks pretty wound up. Wouldn't she usually have dozed off by now? I'm telling ya, something's going on. He was livelier than ever. Perfect. You shouldn't push yourself too hard, Narmaya. And sweet, tender Lyria. Yes, this was how things should be. I cracked open my eyes and stole a hopeful glance at the captain. But on that kind face, I could read only worry and distress. I wanted nothing more than to comfort my darling. No, I was acting for their sakes. I had already come so far. If I could just hold to my path a little longer, make the skies a little safer. Then I could go back to being their big sister. I needed more strength. I needed to be worthy of this family. The crew of the Grand Cipher was powerful, but in the end, we were only small people in a vast sky filled with endless dangers. If I didn't get stronger, one day that sky would engulf us. I had to protect them. I could protect them. All I was lacking was time. I couldn't believe it. I rushed back to Ciro after every mission, but that day the captain had dropped by without my knowledge and taken up a request, a particularly treacherous one. It was careless to think that Sierra would reserve every single dangerous job for me. Ah, uh, the Grand Cypher crew is more than capable of handling it. Couldn't she see? The universe worked in dark and mysterious ways. Their lives were always in danger. If I allowed monsters to wander free through the skies, they're rot would continue to seep until I, just one lonely figure, could no longer hold back the tide. I had to hunt them all down. There was not a moment to lose. I had to cut down the root of evil, so it could never spread again. I would not kill out of malice, nor did I seek meaningless violence. But when weighing the lives of my loved ones against the lives of these beasts, the answer was clear. As long as their threat persisted across the skies, the crew would never truly be safe. And so I would wield my blade to protect the crew and the helpless. For the captain, I would become the harbinger of death. Everything is for the captain. My captain. My dearest captain. I would kill. And kill and kill and kill. Every last threat.
I found the largest known monster's den in this skydom, and began my hunt. Die, for the sake of the skies, and my captain. My blade cut through flesh and bone. Again, again, again and again. And soon, time lost all meaning. How long was I there? Perhaps three, or even four days. My grip went numb, my vision blurred, my body grew heavy. But I couldn't stop, not here. With these hands, I would deliver my loved ones, even if it meant seeping them in blood. Next is 979. I must stay strong for the captain. Free Flutter stance. I must destroy every threat. They must all be eliminated. Come what may. Once more. Life is in my hands have gone numb, but even in death, my sword and I are one. The pond settles. Free Flutter stance. To see me is to see death. Crescent moon. Foam on the sea. Like the death. more above me. I can feel it.
here. your life. Final song. the dawn. Oh, 
all signals. I finally did it. Wait. There's more of them? Impossible. My body had reached its limit. I had managed to fend off countless hordes of monsters, but more kept creeping from the shadows. I summoned the last of my strength for one final swing. Then my sword clattered to the ground. Darkness. Monsters began to close in, claws drawn, ready to kill. I closed my eyes, waiting for it all to end. But before my mind could fade into darkness, I was roused by a brilliant flash. Vermeer! Captain? Let's get you out of here, quickly! You had us worried, you know. Vern, Lyria too? The captain took my hand, but I couldn't leave yet. I had to finish the job. Narmaya, I'm so sorry we didn't notice what you were going through sooner. My heart plunged. I should have been the one apologizing. I was the one who failed. Gently, I tried to withdraw my fingers from the captains. We heard it all from Sierra. Can't believe she's been giving you all the hard jobs. You were doing it to protect us, right? I parted my lips. They needed to understand that it wasn't Ciaro's fault, that I brought this all on myself. But my arid throat could not push out a voice. After a moment of silence, the captain pressed down on my hand. Narmaya, I want to protect those closest to me, same as you. So if something's on your mind, don't keep it to yourself. We're here for you. And just like that, I was overcome with the emotions I had tried so hard to suppress. How could I have been so blind? Not a single one of us could protect the crew. But that's okay. Because all of us could protect each other. The whole is greater than its parts. The captain's grip was firm and led me blinking into the sunlight. There... I saw worry etched into the faces of the crew. I realized that, by putting myself in harm's way, I hurt those who cared for me. Those who loved me, those I wanted to spend my days with, now and forever. But the course I had been following could only lead to isolation. The captain still hadn't let go of my hand, though the grip of those calloused fingers was firm. I felt a gentle kindness in their warmth. Yeah? Your stomach growling? Just give it what it wants! We've received a special request. Are you hungry? I'd be more than happy to feed you. Or maybe you'd like a nap. I always thought I had to be strong for my loved ones. Never truly realizing they were my strength. We supported each other. We lessened the burden of sorrow and shared the light of joy. Lyria, you've got a bit of cream on your cheek. Here, let me wipe it off for you. Oh, um, thank you, Narmaya. I'm glad Butterfly Girl's back to normal. But is it just me, or is she laying it on even thicker than usual? Vern was adorable, trying to play the part of the tough dragon. However, as I took him into my arms, I thought he shouldn't have to put on an act around me. After all, we're a family, aren't we?
On a bright, quiet day, I had a sparring match with the captain. I once locked myself away from the world in the pursuit of strength, training in solitude. But I've since found that I train best with those I love around me, to lend me a guiding hand or an encouraging voice. The captain held nothing back during our session. It seems I'm not the only one who has grown stronger. Our blades rang bright and clear, and the captain's smile is a clear reminder of how far I'd come. After training was over, we stood for a while longer on the deck of the Grand Cipher, feeling the breeze. Above us, the azure sky was spread as far as the eye could see. It's splendor too much to take in all at once. I felt as if I would be consumed by the sky itself, and grasped the captain's hand. In that moment of peace, I swore that I would keep learning and growing. Not alone, but together with those I love. Alright, see you!